Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. And at the time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, join me in prayer. Gracious God, open us up, open our eyes that we may, we may see the world through your eyes and open our ears that we may hear your voice in the midst of the voices. Open our hearts with compassion. And then, O oh God, in response, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. My, uh, my daughter, Cotney, was driving down the road recently and um, there it happened. Uh, she's in her minivan, and there is a dog on the road, just running around, uh, you know, obviously out of where he's supposed to be and uh, in danger of getting hit by a car. And so there's always the question, what shall I do now? Right? Now, my wife and I have an ongoing conversation. I generally am in the, um, that's not our dog. And uh, we have two dogs for whom we are responsible and we will take care of our dogs, but we don't have room for other dogs. And so um, just keep driving. Uh, those of you who aren't dog people don't understand this struggle perhaps. Um, but, but then you have my wife who's like, no, we gotta stop and get that dog. In fact, we stopped one time and got a dog, a, giant yellow lab who then in our house would knock everything over with his tail and uh, I named him Sid to um, to remind them said S-E-D someone else's dog this is not our dog we are not keeping this dog well um, it's it's hard my daughter um, stopped got the dog uh, find, found a no-kill shelter and is now in the business of marketing the dog so someone um, will, will take this pit bull that she picked up off the side of the road. It's funny, it's, a, it's a, just a little vignette, uh, that, but it, it does uh, um, sort of lift up this ongoing tension in our lives, in our faith, about, about taking responsibility. What is my responsibility? When I can let go of things and not think everything is up to me. Last week, Katie Montgomery Mears um, uh, preached an excellent sermon about Caiaphas. Really spoke to my heart about trying to let go. And uh, whole life looser was the image that she used. About how Caiaphas just wanted to manipulate every outcome to figure out exactly what he could do to make it come out the way he wanted it to come out. He would push every button and pull every string and make things happen in order to get Jesus crucified so that uh, his power could be preserved. 
But today we see sort of the flip side, the, the far other pole with Pilate. Pontius Pilate um, releases the responsibility. He, he had every, um, every opportunity to save Jesus, but he chooses not to. He chooses to shirk his responsibility. And sometimes we can err on both sides. Uh, let's uh, talk about Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was the governor of um, Judea. Let me give you just a little of the, of the history. If you're not a history person, just check your Facebook feed or something during this uh, little section. Um, after uh, Herod the Great was, um, had been made king of, of all of Palestine, all of Israel, uh, by the Roman emperor. And so he was not, uh, not of the line of kings, he of the Hasmonean kings who were before him, but he had been made king by the emperor. And uh, this is the king, uh, King Herod, that was alive when Jesus was born. Well, after King Herod died, very shortly after Jesus was born, the kingdom was divided. The Roman emperor divided the kingdom among his sons and one daughter, actually. Um, but uh, King Herod Archelaus was given responsibility for Judea. Uh, Herod Antipas was given responsibility for the north, for uh, Galilee. Herod Philip was given responsibility for the northeast, the section across the Jordan River up to the north. And below that was the Decapolis, which was 10 independently ruled cities um, that weren't Jewish at all. Well, um, what happened was Herod Archelaus was so cruel that a group of people, a group of leaders from uh, Jerusalem, went to Rome and asked that he be removed, that uh, rebellions were happening, and that if he wasn't removed, just it was going to be a, a revolt. And so uh, the emperor removed Herod Archelaus, and uh, he was exiled, actually. And instead of putting another king in charge, they actually... Uh, sent a, a Roman governor, um, a uh, Cyrenius uh, is sent there to be in charge. And uh, that's who Pilate was. Pilate was a governor. He was uh, the governor from 26 to 36 AD. Well, uh, Pilate, um, he didn't particularly like being the governor of, uh, of Judea. I mean, you could be in Rome where everything's beautiful, or you can be in Judea, uh, which is a desert and uh, just a a, a difficult assignment. And so um, Caiaphas, the high priest, brings Jesus to, to Pilate. And Pilate says, um, man, I don't want to deal with this. And so he sends him to Herod Antipas, who is the, the king of Galilee. And Antipas says, look, he's in Judea. I'm not going to deal with him. So he sends him back to Pilate. And what we see here in this, um, in this passage in Matthew is the second interview Pilate has with, with Jesus. And you, you probably know the story. He then uh, puts Jesus and Barabbas out. It's the Passover. The tradition is to release one prisoner um, for the Jews just uh, as, a, as a, um, a gesture. And they choose Barabbas. And so um, Jesus is, is crucified. And this dramatic scene where Pilate washes his hands in front of the group and says, I am not responsible. This is on you. You know, um, one of the things Katie said last week that I really spoke to me was she said that in each one of us, um, in each of our hearts, there's a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of Caiaphas. Well, I would tell you in each of our hearts, there's a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of Pilate who wants to just wash our hands of it all. It's, it's not up to me. Let's look and see what, what Pilate does and see how we might see ourselves in it. First of all, Pilate knows what is right, but it's complicated. Right? It's complicated because you've got Caiaphas and the priests who are, are barking at him on one side. You have the crowd who is rumbling considering revolt. You have Rome who is putting pressure on him to keep everything quiet. It's complicated. He's got all of these voices, and yet at the same time, he knows that Jesus is innocent. 
uh, uh, let's, um, verses 18 and 19 today, he says, for he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. He knew it. He knew it wasn't because of his crimes. Then uh, uh, verse um, Verse 19, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Um, it is over and over again, he's seeing why he knows that Jesus is innocent. In the Gospel of John, um, the 19th chapter, there is a, a, a different um, narrative about exactly how it went, and in it, Pilate says, I see no guilt in this man. He, he, after the crucifixion even, Pilate puts a sign over Jesus' head that says, King of the Jews, in three languages, Latin, Aramaic, and Hebrew. And um, uh, the, the chief priests come to him and say, no, no, it needs to say, he said he was King of the Jews, and that's why he's being crucified. But Pilate said, no, King of the Jews it is right? I, I know who he was. I know he's the Messiah. I recognize that. He didn't need to die like this. He knew what was right, but it was complicated. You know, I, our lives are always complicated that way. It is never that simple, right? We love, we, we would love it to be black and white, uh, easy to know, and, and uh, simple to do the right thing. But it's, it's never that easy. There are always conflicting values, always conflicting things pulling us in each and every direction. But Jesus, Jesus teaches us how to live. Matthew 5 through 7 is a very specific pattern of life that he teaches us. Then, in, then throughout his life, for those three years, he teaches us in, in parables and works miracles to show us what it's like to live as part of the kingdom of God, to live according to the pattern and values of the kingdom. And then he, he practices that with his own life as he shows us that uh, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and sacrificially goes to the cross for all of us. It is a particular way of life. And even in the midst of, of, the, of the complicated world we live in, we, when, we, uh, when we stay focused on who Jesus is and how he lives, we know what's right. And we just have to have the courage to do it, even when times are complicated. So the first thing to note is that Pilate Pilate knew what was right, but it was complicated. Here, here, here's the second thing. Pilate um, wanted to please the crowd. In the Mark version of this, there is um, uh, these words. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them, after, and after flogging Jesus, handed him over to be, to be crucified. Boy, oh boy, do we like to go along with the crowd, with the, with the, the um, power of public opinion. I don't know if you've read the book or seen the movie Just Mercy. It's a, a great book by Brian Stevenson, who is an attorney who founded the Equal Justice Initiative. And this is sort of a, a part of how it was founded or, or what, what its purpose is. And it is the story of Walter McMillan, who um, was wrongly convicted of a murder um, in, in Monroe County, Alabama. And um, as he was serving his time, but continued to maintain his in innocence and the Equal Justice Initiative discovered it and um, began to be involved in the case. And Brian Stevenson goes to the Monroe uh, County District Attorney, a man named Tom Chapman, he, he is, not, the time has passed and the attorney who, the DA who had, had convicted um, McMillan had, had long since gone and this guy was the new, uh, the new D, uh, DA. And Chapman uh, listens as Brian Stevenson presents his case that in fact it is 
it is a wrongful conviction and that, that there are so many flaws and, and failures in the case. And he's sort of shaking his head. Yeah, I, I see that. Yeah, I see that. I see that. And then he says, but, but nothing convinces me that he's, uh, that he's not guilty. Everyone around here knows he's guilty. It was just, he was, uh, Stevenson was just overwhelmed with frustration. How can you possibly just, just because everybody believed, he just didn't want to, uh, to buck public a, a opinion. As he's, as he's walking out of his office, um, someone offers him a flyer that says, here's the next showing of To Kill a Mockingbird. So much irony uh, as, the, as the book is about uh, just such a situation. Um, of standing up for someone who is being railroaded. What's interesting is that later in the story, Tom Chapman comes around and against public opinion um, uh, begins to take the right stand, right? It, it, is, it is so hard for us to go against the flow, uh, to, to step out of what others around us, the context is telling us is, is right and wrong. What I find so interesting right now is that it seems like um, there's more than one crowd, right? So, you, you, you know, for whatever the situation, whatever the, uh, uh, the issue, there, there's a crowd on one side and there's a crowd on the other side. And both crowds are pushing. And we like to think I'm standing against the crowd because I'm standing against those people over there. But the truth is what I'm really doing is standing over here on this side as part of this crowd part of this tribe, putting my uh, feet in with these folks. What I find so amazing about Jesus is that's not how he did that. No, what, what Jesus did that was so amazing is he took, uh, he, he, ref, he did not stand with the Romans by any stretch of the imagination, but he did not stand with the zealots who were trying to overthrow Rome. He, he didn't stand with the Pharisees, but he certainly didn't stand with the Sadducees who focused on temple worship. You see, there were all of these factions, all of these parties that were at work in the time of Jesus, but Jesus refused to stand with any of them. No, he stood on his own. He showed the way of the kingdom and had to stand alone. Sometimes even his disciples deserted him. Friends, it's hard to go against the flow. We want so much to be part of a tribe uh, to feel like we fit. And we find ourselves uh, listening to all these voices uh, trying to draw us in. Uh, but it's not up to us to satisfy the crowd. Here's the third thing that I think, um, that I think Pilate teaches us. So we know what's right even when it's complicated. We can we find out and, and take a stand about what's right even when it's complicated. Second, we, uh, we don't do what we do in order to, to satisfy the crowd. But, but third, he just um, wanted to deflect responsibility to someone else. I mean, really, that's the essence of this story. He just didn't want to take responsibility. He blamed Jesus, right? He said, look, speak up for yourself. If you can just speak up for yourself, then I, I, can, I can help you, but you won't speak up for yourself as, as uh, Jesus Christ superstar says, die if you want to, you misguided martyr. He, he uh, deflected um, responsibility to the, to the high priest, Caiaphas, and the other priests, saying, look, it's them who's pushing me. It's not my fault. They're the ones pushing. He sent him to Herod, hoping that Herod would take responsibility. But Herod said, you know, I'm a Jewish king, and this happened in, in Judea, not in Galilee. He, uh, he then turned to the crowd and said, you guys take responsibility, and then washed his hands in front of them. Now, there are lots of ways we deflect responsibility. Sometimes we say, look, it's the system. I can't do anything about it. That's just how the system works. You got to go with the flow. Uh, you got to work with what, what is, is around you. Sometimes we just say, look, it's, it's, this is not in, in my, the scope of my responsibility. This part is not in the scope of my duties. Um, what is it that uh, 
um, I've heard uh, young people say, which uh, the millennials say, I love it. Uh, and I think it's an old Polish proverb. Uh, not my circus, not my monkeys. These aren't my folks. I'm not responsible for them. They're going to just do what they're going to do. Yeah, maybe. There's a, a, a story that I've found funny. It's told by Bernard Brown Jr., who was the a CEO of a um, healthcare system in, in Georgia. And he tells the story of, of uh, a patient being in bed and spilling a cup of water and just outside the bed. And he, he called the nurse because he was afraid to get up. He was afraid he would slip on it. And what he didn't know was that they had a policy in the hospital that if it was a small, if it was a small uh, spill, then a nurse's aide could clean it up. But if it was a large spill, they were supposed to call the housekeeping who would come with a bucket and everything and clean it up. And so the, the nurse's aide looked at it and said, well, that's a small spill. So I, I mean, that's a large spill, so I'm gonna call housekeeping. And housekeeping came and they looked at it and said, well, that's a small spill, so you're, you're supposed to clean it up. It's a, it, it, that's for nurse's aides to clean up. Nobody wanted to take responsibility. Apparently the patient just took a, 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 a pitcher of water then and poured the whole thing on the floor so that somebody would say, well, now that clearly is a large spill. Um, I'll clean it up. We, we, there's a point at which we take respons We have to take responsibility for things that may seem outside of our scope, outside of our job, outside of, of our responsibilities. There is that balance between claiming responsibility and, and realizing that we have finite power and we can't change everything. We, we can only be responsible for what we choose to do for our own lives. Uh, Emil Bruner is a, was a Swiss theologian and he li uh, lived in the early part of the 20th century uh, wrote during the, the Second World War. Um, and, you know, Switzerland thought of as very neutral, right? Um, but that just bothered him, this idea of neutrality. And he, uh, he talked, uh, preached a lot and taught a lot about, wrote a lot about personal responsibility, about taking responsibility, and uh, uh, um, that this sort of rejecting uh, the reformer's notion of everything is in God's plan, everything is determined, everything is already pre-done and predisposed, and everything happens for a reason. He said, absolutely not. We must take responsibility for our own decisions. We have choices we can make. And, and to be a, a follower of Jesus is to take those choices, is to make those choices and take responsibility for them. No, too often we just resign ourselves. John Thornburg is a um, United Methodist pastor uh, and a musician, a good friend of our own uh, Sid Davis. He works in Austin at a, a place called the Texas Methodist Foundation. And uh, TMF sent a, a, a poem to those of us who are uh, supporters of TMF that was written by John. He's a great poet. And um, I just want to read a little part of it. The poem is called Choose the Silence of Awe. Here's what he says. Which silence will we choose? Will it be the silence of awe? Or will it be the silence of fear? The drugged silence of submission to what is. The dreadful silence when que sera sera is all we know how to say. The silence that signals resignation. I'm giving up, can't do anything to pass off the responsibility. Here's the truth, you can't, you can't relieve your responsibility. You can't um, pass it off or relinquish it. Isn't it interesting that even though Pilate washed his hands every single Sunday when we say the Apostles' Creed, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, we recognize his responsibility. We know it now. There's a, there's a, a verse in this passage that um, I think really speaks about all of it. Kind of 
summarizes it. It's a, as soon as the crowd has um, called for Barabbas to be released, here's what the scripture says. Pilate said to them, what then should I do with this Jesus who is the, called the Messiah? What then should I do with this Jesus who's in front of me? <laughs> with my daughter, it was a dog. And she had to make a decision. But that's a dog. What do we do with other human beings? With difficult decisions we make about how we treat them, about how we will live our lives. I like to imagine that Jesus is right here with me the whole time as I uh, make those decisions, as I sit in the car, as I uh, sit at the table, as I'm struggling with the decisions that I make. When I see the hungry and the homeless, what then should I do with this Jesus whose eyes I see in, in the one who is hungry? Or, or what then shall I do with this one who is marginalized or oppressed? What then shall I do with this checkbook that I have here and making decisions about how I'll spend my money? What then shall I do when I'm sitting with this Jesus, when I'm sitting here in a voting booth, deciding how, how I'm going to vote? What then shall I do with this Jesus when I'm in conflict with someone else? What then shall I do with this Jesus when I'm struggling to make my marriage work or, or deal with my family? All, all of these so important decisions that we face, we can't shirk responsibility for them and just completely let go. No, there is a balance, isn't there? There's always tensions in the faith. And there's a tension between, I can't do everything, and I'm going to have to trust God, with, I can do something, and I'm going to do it. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, what shall we do with this Jesus? How, how will we choose to live our lives? We confess that it's complicated, God, but we know that there is a right and wrong and that you show us what that right and wrong is as we seek to live by the pattern Jesus taught. Forgive us when we simply go along with the crowd. Forgive us when we shirk responsibility, when we say it's, it's outside our scope not my job. Teach us that we can't wash our hands of the world into which you've put us. Help us to live as you would have us live and to take responsibility for, for our own lives. In the name of Christ we pray.